Um, I have followed Ishai for many years when he was on Aros Sheva radio and then he was um, at a, a different platform and now he is on the land of Israel. Um, Ishai Fleischer is the international spokesperson for Jewish community of Hebron and, and it has really become the hotspot of the Middle East. Uh, it is a site of the tomb of our biblical patriarchs and matriarchs. Um, he is a frequent columnist for the Daily Wire, Jewish Press, uh, JNS. He's been on CNN, Fox, Vice, Al Jazeera, and BBC. He is a staunch defender of Jewish rights to Judea and Shamron. He's published um, a controversial piece in the New York Times a couple of years ago um, outlining five alternatives to the two-state solution, uh, as he likes to call it, two-state delusion, I think. I think he's the one who coined that term. Um, he was also at the forefront of the fight against UNESCO's anti-Jewish decision, which led to the U.S. administration's exit from that organization. Uh, Isha is a graduate of Cardozo Law School. He has rabbinic coordination, and he is, as I mentioned, a broadcaster at the Land of Israel. Um, Ishai Fleischer. All right. So a little housekeeping, by the way, guys. Um, what we would love to do is we would love to have your voices. If you have a question, um, please chat it in the chat box, and then Devorah will call on you so you can ask it yourself, okay? And generally, just because we're trying to encourage people to turn on their cameras so we can see who we're talking to, uh, we will call on people first who have their cameras on. So if you want to ask your question, turn on your camera. Um, Okay, Ishai. So um, let's just jump right to it. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking and I'm seeing that, you know, most of the people are sort of like already plugged in. They understand the issues. So my first question to you is, what is the most misunderstood thing about Hebron in a geopolitical um, sense? When people think Hebron, unless they're, you know, un unless they are uh, devoutly Christian evangelicals who really do think in biblical terms, for most Jews, Hebron is this scary um, hedgehog that is just don't go there, don't visit, don't don't you dare to even bring it up. What what do you, why do you think that is, and how can we move forward, past that? Okay, everybody, thank you very much. Masha, first thing, thank you so much. Dvorah, thank you so much. I'm a big fan of Club Z. Club Z is like the kind of thing that you sit around with, uh, with pro-Israel folks and you're like, we got to do this. <laughs> but, you know, this never happens because we got other things that we're doing. And then somebody picks up the, the, the gauntlet and makes this happen. And I think that it's great. And it's, it's just a totally uh, honor for me to be uh, part of it on a small scale and and anytime i'm invited to do anything with club z i just think this is this is one of the most important things i have to drop everything else and do it um so i just want to wish you guys continued success and growth thank you um that's number one number two you forgot to say in my uh, bio the most important thing which is i'm also a russian jew right true, and, true that. uh, that, that's very very important and the reason that's important also is because um in part uh, my Russianness also informs my nationalness. See, people see, you know, this, this beard and they see this kippah and they say, okay, so you're, you know, nationalist or so-called right wing because you're religious. And I say to them, truth is, is I could take this kippah and fling it away and I'll have the same uh, general attitude towards things because I'm also a Russian Jew and I have a strong sense of ethnic Jewish nationalism uh, and the rights of Jewish people as a people <clears throat> separate from the, the, the biblical, historical, Jewish, religious aspect of it. We have an ethnic national truth, and Israel is an ethnic national state, and we have a right to this land. It's our historic homeland. And so that informs very much my, my, my sense. Just interestingly enough about Russian Jews, American Jews, and if you look in the passport of an American Jew, it doesn't say his identity in terms of ethnicity or religion. But Jews in America are called Jewish or Jews 
which is usually about a reference to the religion, is that I practice a certain religion. If you look in a Russian, in a Soviet uh, a passport, it said Ivri, or Hebrew, which is really not a religious connotation at all, but rather an ethnic connotation. They're ethnically Jewish, just like you could be ethnically Tatar, or you could be ethnically Polish, or whatever it is, you're an ethnic uh, Jew. And that's a very important uh, thing. The truth is, is both are true. It's important to have a fusion of our ethnic identity and our religious identity. Sometimes in America, we lose the ethnic identity. We think that being Jewish <clears throat> is just food and culture and, 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 and synagogue. But the truth is, if you keep that ethnic uh, aspect, then that really informs both your rights to the land of Israel and also it informs also how you behave uh, for example, in, in terms of marriage and other things, we know we have, a, we have a problem in America with assimilation because the identity is based not on a tribal identity, but just on a religious identity. When you have an additional tribal peoplehood identity, it helps a lot. And, and that goes very much to the heart, Masha, of the question of Hebron, because Hebron, Hebron, or Hebron, we'll call it from here on, is really the root of our ethnic identity our peoplehood identity. It's the, it's the place of the foundation of Jewish peoplehood. And if you think about it, you have Jerusalem and Hebron. These are the two holy sites of the Jewish people. Jerusalem stands for what, what Martin Buber called the I-thou relationship. It's my relationship with God, the other. I come to the Western Wall, hopefully to the Temple Mount, right? And I talk to God, or I argue with God, or I yell at God. All those things, by the way, hating God, being angry with God, uh, uh, arguing with God, these are very Jewish things. If you do these things, uh, then, 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 then you can proudly call yourself Israel, which means, you know, fights, fights with God. Uh, that's totally fine. As long as God says, as long as you call me, you can call me whatever you want, as long as you call me. And that's what we Jewish people do. We love him. We hate him. We, we, we deal with him. We try to just love him. But, but that's Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a religious place, temple. Right, and there was a religious act that took place that started the story of Jerusalem, which is the binding of Isaac. But Hebron is not like that at all. Hebron is the place that Abraham purchased in order to bury his beloved wife, Sarah. And it was the first purchase of the Jewish people in the land of Israel. And if you look in the Bible, you will not find any uh, mention of God in that purchase. Uh, Abraham is negotiating with the Hittites, and he is in no way invoking the name of God. He is doing a business transaction. The purchase uh, of, of, of the tomb of the patriarchs and matriarchs in Hebron is a transactional uh, money, monetary transaction that is also recorded and sealed as witnesses. And it's the first purchase of the Jewish people in the land of Israel. So it's an actual uh, uh, you know, uh, foothold, legally speaking, in a different, not in a godly doctrine, in a this worldly purchase doctrine. Um, and then the rest of the biblical family, the founding family of the Jewish people. So it's Abraham and Sarah, a couple. Isaac and Rebecca, a couple. Jacob and Leah, a couple, are buried there. So it's also the story of love. I like to say that Hebron is a little bit like Virginia, Virginia is for lovers, right? You knew that, right? Virginia, that's the code, the, the tagline for Virginia. Virginia is for lovers. So too, Hebron is for lovers. But it's really about the people that got together to build the first family, to come together to build the first family of Israel. So I tell people all the time, if you, uh, people think the opposite. People think that Jerusalem, since it's the capital, is nationalistic. And Hebron, since it's this crazy place, that you have to, you know, be quite, uh, quite tough and oftentimes observant in order to hold on to is religious. I say, no, it's the opposite. Jerusalem is actually a religious idea, although it became, of course, our, our national capital. But the peoplehood aspect is what Hebron is really about. And I just want to show you a few pictures, if I may. Let's just look at a few pictures just to get a feel of the place. Uh, first thing, this is from, uh, this is a great, uh, uh, wall. Where is this wall? It's in Phoenix, Arizona. Okay, but uh, you could see that at the JCC that they're trying very hard to keep people connected. And what I'm so happy about this wall is, although Judea and Samaria, the so-called West Bank, is marked differently, still you see the holy cities Hebron 
Bethlehem, that's where I live, Jericho, Ramallah, Nablus. What's Nablus? That's, that's the Arab name for Shechem. Nablus is actually a Roman word. It comes from the word Neapolis, but they don't pronounce the P. So they go Nablus, but Neapolis means Neopolis, a new city, new city. All right, this was the land that was supposed to be the Jewish people's um, uh, before, the, before the British cut away the Transjordan and gave it to their friends, the Hashemites, creating the, in my opinion, the first Palestinian state. All right, they took a chunk of Jewish land, gave it to the Arabs. That's called Palestine, but today it's called Jordan. All right, we're not going to go through all the maps right now. Uh, these are the cities, the important cities inside the so-called West Bank, Judea and Samaria. It starts uh, at the bottom, Beersheba, which is not in uh, Judea and Samaria, but kind of starts off this, um, uh, these seven holy cities, seven important cities. Uh, there's one missing. Oh, there's, there's all seven in here. So you have Beersheba, then you go to Hebron, then you go to Bethlehem, Ephrat, that's where I live, Jerusalem, Bethel, that's where Jacob had his dream of the ladder, Beit El, Shiloh, where the temple stood, and Shechem, Nablus, uh, in the capital of Samaria. All right. This is the, the uh, so-called deal of the century. Well, maybe we'll get to it later. This is a picture I just took uh, uh, just a few days ago. This is a picture of um, Silwan in Eastern Jerusalem. <clears throat> and the Arabs have taken a cue from the Christians. They light up their houses for Ramadan. But if you notice in this picture, you'll see three Jewish stars. Those are Jewish so-called settlers, proud Jews who live in tough places in order to hold on to the land of Israel. And they put up big Jewish stars to let you know that amongst this Arab neighborhood, there's also Jews that live here. All right, this is the land of Israel from space. Great shot. And you can see that people are coming to, to the Western Wall. And we'll see in a second. Uh, oh, yeah, this is great. Uh, this is, uh, of the many tweets that I collect, this is a good one. Thousands of fanatic Israeli settlers broke into the Al-Aqsa compound in occupied Jerusalem last night and desecrated the Al-Burak wall. All right, that says it all. This tweet is so great. That's why I love it. You know, I love it when they just like uh, make an encyclopedia of their, of their uh, attack, on, of their anti-Israel attacks. So Israelis are fanatic. They're also settlers. Obviously, the people who came to the Western Wall are not settlers. Not all of them, anyway. They broke into the Al-Aqsa compound. That's what the Temple Mount has been renamed in Occupy Jerusalem. Uh, that, that's the new way of saying Jerusalem. And desecrated the famous Al-Burak wall where Muhammad's horse uh, flew up to heaven. So you can see that in, in our world today, replacement theology has been replaced by replacement narrative. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So replacement theology has been replaced by replacement narrative. This is not replacement theology. This is a replacement narrative. This is a doll that they're selling. Uh, it's an action figure, you know. Uh, let's keep going. I love this one. This is one of my favorite pictures of them all. Everything about Israel is illegal. Not the occupation, not Judea and Samaria, not the West Bank, not apartheid. It's just the whole damn thing is illegal, okay? That's the way, that, that's, that's a very honest uh, poster there. In any case, this you could see is the Western Wall. This is a fabulous picture. And there's the Temple Mount uh, above it. And that's where Jews went to today when we started talking about this. You could see Muslims, it's very important to them to come there, not during Corona, this was not during Corona, uh, but they come there during Ramadan season. All right, Hebron is a little bit, it's about an hour south of Jerusalem. And you could see in this picture, that we have a lot of um, people coming there for various reasons. In this case, it's soldiers not protecting the place, but coming to um, be sworn in. Why would they be sworn in here? Because it's a very important Jewish site. And this site, this building that you're seeing, what you're seeing right now is actually three different periods. You're seeing a 2000 year old building. That's the majority of it. But on the left side, you see a little bit of a, a crusader building that was built about 800 years ago, and you see a minaret and, and a kind of upper lip that was built starting in the year 1267 by the Mamluks. When the Mamluks came to this building that was built by King Herod, who built the Western, the, the Temple Mount and the Western Wall as well, the Temple and the Western Wall as well, uh, he built this monument to mark the tombs of the fathers and mothers, which was in Hebron, 
the tombs are 3,800 years old. Sometimes the tomb is, gets dressed up. We get dressed up here in Israel for Yom Atzmaut uh, through Yom Yerushalayim. And you could see uh, Israel Independence Day towards Jerusalem Day. You could see that we dress up our, uh, our beloved building here. Just, uh, these, are, these are first graders, uh, no, excuse me, third graders from the town of Ephrat. Um, and they came to the tomb of the fathers and mothers to celebrate receiving their first book of Genesis, book of Bereshit. So you can see a whole school come to this spot. All right, uh, the tomb today is split into two. There is a area that is Muslim and an area that's Jewish. This is after the 1996, uh, 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 1996 uh, uh, the famous, excuse me, 1994, uh, uh, famous Goldstein attack and massacre. And the tomb has been divided into two. This part that you're seeing is the part that's the Muslim part. But 10 days a year, Jews get to go into the whole building, including the Muslim part. And 10 days a year, the Arabs get to go into the whole building, including the Jewish part. This is the tomb of Isaac. Okay, all kind, these are Sephardic men that are coming to do certain Sephardi prayers. And you see they're in the same room, just in a different part of it. And you can see there's different kinds of Jews that show up. These guys. And this guy, this guy's Rabbi Shlomo Katz, famous uh, musician and rabbi. He, he shows up on Sukkot. But there's all, all kinds of folks that show up, including this. This is pre-corona, as you can probably guess. Uh, these are uh, uh, Chinese friends of mine. Uh, here I am. You see me in the middle. I'm uh, here to the left. I'm there also. Uh, and uh, they uh, are Christian Chinese folks. I said to them, how many are you guys? They said, oh, 100 million. I said, okay. Hope to see more of you here. We do a lot to try to bring people in to the Tomb of the Fathers and Mothers. These are actually new immigrants to the land of Israel, Americans, and I was touring them. We do a lot of festivals to bring people in because it's an hour long drive from Jerusalem. Some parts of it are a little bit uncomfortable, so we do our best to make it attractive to come and visit us. All right, including these nights. Look at that, that we do that stuff at night. We, we put this like artwork on the, on the building. It's called video mapping. And it's really a lot of fun to be able to bring people in and get them to, to feel comfortable and, and, and fun. We do these shows. This is a women's concert that we have. Look at the concert and behind it, there's the building, right? And this is just an all women's concert. These are 3000 women that show up uh, to hear. Um... So right, I, I want to move, move us a little bit forward. Just and... one more second. I'm almost done. Sure. I'm almost done. Okay. Here it is. I just wanted to show you this. You see this? This is one little thing I wanted to show you, Masha. Look at this. This is the so-called tomb of, of Abraham, but it's not really the tomb of Abraham. It's really the tomb. It's really the marker. And I just want you to know little things that I got to do in life. For me, the most exciting thing in life is when I get to change something. So we had these old signs here and they were crap, but the, but the Hebron people were like, they're beautiful. They're classic. And I'm like, no, we have to change them. And the big thing that I was able to do was I, I was able to bring in English mm. onto the sign. They were like, why do we need English? I'm like, maybe because we have a million and a half tourists a year who don't read Hebrew. So we were able to, to, to change that. And I just, this is my last point here. Right across from Abraham is the, the marker of Sarah. And that's really what this building is all about. It's about fathers and mothers. It's about Jewish peoplehood. Uh, and that's what's so unique about Hebron. Uh, but at the same time, as I already showed you, the Muslim world has wanted to challenge our hold on this place for a long time, uh, including in the year 1267, when they came in and they kicked out all the Jews from the building itself. They kicked out the Jews from the building itself and they said, no longer are you allowed to be here. This is actually a Muslim site. And recently uh, I had to fight with, and this is, goes to your question, Masha, I had to fight with UNESCO because UNESCO, this UN organization decided that the Tomb of the Mothers and Fathers is actually a Palestinian World Heritage Site and, and not an, a Jewish one, which is shocking. The building is built by a Jewish king. The, the tombs are Jewish tombs. But we are living in a time where a place like Hebron is under the attack of what you're facing in California as well in terms of the education curriculum, um, which is the erasure of Jewish history under the guise of liberalism. In the guise of liberalism, something very liberal is happening, illiberal, which is the erasure of Jewish history and the um, national identity theft. 
that is taking place uh, using sometimes international organizations, sometimes great schools like Berkeley. Uh, and Hebron is one of the places that they want to get rid of, especially because it is the root of Jewish people. Right. Something that I've heard you say um, that, you know, if, if we don't have a claim to Hebron, we certainly don't have any claim to Tel Aviv or Haifa or any of the, you know, appropriate cities for our friends on the left. Um, can, you, can you paint a picture of what is life like in Hebron for a Jew? And also, when do we get to, do we get to liberate the rest of Hebron? Do we want to? Is, is there... Is there something in the future that we could hope for, pray for, work towards? All right, so, so the first question is an easy one to answer. There's 90 families that live in Hebron, uh, and we have our next door sister city called Kiryat Arba. We're a block of about 10,000 Jews, and there's about 200,000 Arabs that live there. So uh, we live in our community, we have schools, we have transportation. There are buses from Jerusalem Central Bus Station every hour. We have supermarkets. We have everything kind of normal in Kiryat Arba. And the Jews of Hebron, they travel five minutes to Kiryat Arba. They live in a mixed city. There are Arabs walking around. Um, and we live in an area of town that was designated H2, Hebron 2, which means that uh, it's still under Israeli military. Uh, and uh, basically military control. Municipal, we have our own small municipality there, but the infrastructure is all Palestinian. So it's a very weird system that's going on there. It's a very mixed system. And a lot of times when they, like for example, the tomb of the fathers and mothers has an access problem for um, handicapped people. It's all stairs. Well, for years we've been trying to build an elevator, but the Palestinian Authority and the Waqf, which is the Muslim Authority, have been blocking um, the, the construction of such a thing. Why? Because they don't want it to be that the Jews have another piece of sovereignty or another success. They want it to be a mosque, not a Jewish site. And it is indeed a mosque. And so uh, life for Jewish people in Hebron has been, throughout the years, very tough. There's been many years of tremendous uh, sniping, shooting, attacks, stabbing. About three and a half years ago, my good friend, the Russian Jew, Gennady Kaufman, was murdered there. Gennady was somebody who worked with me, and we were just really getting to know one, one another. We liked one another, and he was murdered right before Hanukkah, uh, almost four years ago. It'll be Hanukkah four years. So, um, you know, on the one hand, it's tough. On the other hand, we have about a million and a half tourists a year that come to Hebron. A lot of people come from all over the world and Israel to pray and connect and, and to learn about Hebron. With regarding to the rest of Hebron, that goes, Masha, right into the bigger question of, of Palestine or Israel, of, as we call the title of this talk, liberation or occupation. So, you know, there are different voices amongst even Jews. Can you believe it? Jews don't have one opinion. They have many opinions. So, uh, you know, for people on the left, They'd love to see Jews not living in Hebron. Why should we be within the Arab world? Why should we provoke them? Um, um, it's, why should we use a thousand soldiers to protect these Jews? Uh, it's, a, it's a bad use of resources, and it's, a, it's just a pain. But for the nationalist side, we say, this is the root of our claim to the land of Israel. If you can't claim Hebron, and if you will agree that it's a Palestinian city and you don't have a Jewish presence there at the tomb of your forefathers, so you really lose, and mothers, you, you, you lose your, your connection to a historical Israel. And the truth is, is that the Balfour Declaration and San Remo and the mandate at the League of Nations, they're all predicated on our historical indigeneity in this land. If you undermine the places of history, you've actually undermined your very claim to the land of Israel. Not to mention that Jewish people, religiously speaking, like to come to this place and connect to it. And, and so to, uh, as I said, a million and a half tourists a year. Uh, and so um, we fight 
for this right. And we've been at times an ethnic majority. Today we're an ethnic minority. So what's the future going to look like? Well, that really depends on, you know, which pathway we take. The Oslo path was one in which we were losing sovereignty in the, in the land of Israel and in Judea and Samaria. And terrorism, of course, began because the uh, peace partners really are not peace partners. They actually see it as a way of gaining more land in order to attack Israel from a new forward base that they've attained through diplomacy. And so uh, people on the nationalistic side think that we have every reason not to give away this land, militarily, strategically, security-wise, that's one. Uh, historically, and our historic claim is another. Spiritually, and for the very identity. Uh, the word spiritually, not everybody likes that word. Let's just use the word identity. Uh, Hebron is, is the core of our identity. And our enemies are very smart. I don't believe in underestimating our enemies at all. I'm, I'm of the belief that we should always uh, take them more seriously rather than less seriously. And I think that they have a great sense that Hebron and places like Hebron represent the root of the Jewish people in the land of Israel. And they also sense that it's politically weak. And so they will work very hard to undermine it, both on the ground here by building all around, and Israel's weak at, at stopping this building, and by reaching out to young people in places like California and telling them Jews stole the land, Jews abuse other people. Hebron is a perfect example of how Jews are bad. And Jews should not be in Khalil, which is the name of Hebron in Arabic, Khalil, which, uh, by the way, means the same thing as Hebron. But in any case, um, that is, that is the, the battle lines uh, for places like this. It's not, it's not a coincidence that UNESCO was used. UNESCO erases both uh, three places. It erases Jerusalem. Jerusalem's not Jewish. It's the Al-Burak Wall. Uh, the tomb of Rachel is actually the tomb of Bilal bin Rabbah, the helper of Muhammad who never stepped foot in the land of Israel, but who is somehow buried at the tomb of Rachel exactly. Uh, and also uh, the, the tomb of the fathers and mothers in Hebron. They want to erase these places. They right. want to erase these places and take them over, rename them under their names, and thereby oust us. And then oust us from Judea and Samaria to oust us from the rest of, of Israel as well, and create a, a so-called historic Palestine in its place. That's the, that's the battle. And the battle is both physical and what I call the narrative war, the narrative war, which is what you guys are fighting at Club Z in large measure. If, if some of your boys and girls will become soldiers in the Israeli army, they'll also fight the physical war. But in the meantime, on campus, they're fighting the narrative war, which is this war to try to erase Jewish identity and the Jewish story. Well, I can tell you that um, we were planning Israel trip. It was, we were supposed to go this July. Uh, we're gonna go next July for sure. Um, and I can tell you that um, Hebron was one of our stops and you were gonna meet the group and uh, show us around. Sure. And um, the biggest pushback that I have received from parents are the parents, those that have lived in Israel and now live in the United States. Um, my relatives, when I come to Israel and I go to Hebron, they're like, oh, why, why are you going there? What is wrong with you? So I think a lot of work still needs to be done on both sides. Right. First plan. thing, Masha, I want you to know that your work uh, is, is only just beginning because you keep on talking about clubs in, uh, in North Carolina. Those are great. But we need one in Ashdod and in Ashkelon and in Netanya and these places. Our, our, our Russian, especially Russian Jewish brothers and sisters, uh, have an amazing lack of, uh, they have amazing pride and yet an amazing lack of, uh, of Jewish knowledge. And, and it's all together. You know, my life for me, just, I'm just talking about myself personally. Like, if I'm not reading Torah stuff, then I'm reading Jewish history. If I'm not reading Jewish history, I'm reading the newspaper about what's going on in Israel. If, you know, my, my whole life revolves around putting the pieces of the Jewish story, which is complex and sophisticated, uh, together and understanding. And it's, and it's really, it's really a lot of information. Uh, if you don't have a lot of information, you get told, uh, you get sold a very simple story. We're occupiers. We've stolen somebody else's land. Uh, they're the indigenous, uh, please forgive me, they're the indigenous brown people. We are the occupying colonial 
white people. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a story that's, that's easy to buy. It's a story that's e easy to buy. And we uh, have to work very hard to make sure that our young people don't, don't fall for that. And your friends, your Israeli friends, are part of a, of a narrative that they've been told for a long time. Uh, for example, right after the Six Day War, there were many Israelis, including leadership, who thought that this was our bargaining chip. What an opportunity to give it back to the Arabs, but only if they would make peace. Uh, other Jews, I guess I'm that type, said, no, this is the essential Jewish homeland. We already have a Palestine. It's called Jordan. And we don't need a Palestine in the so-called West Bank. Uh, by the way, of, of the land of Israel, there's already one Palestine, which is Jordan, another Palestine, which is Gaza, an effort to make a new Palestine, which is the West Bank, with, of course, the right of return to the regular Israel, which means four Palestinian states on one Jewish land mass. Right. I don't think that's very equitable. Uh, I think that Jordan is, is quite enough. Uh, and even that's a problem in many ways, but okay. Uh, but people that come from my perspective don't think we have to give up land. And that is, in my opinion, not the Middle East way to do things. It, ironically, when we give land for peace, we are actually acting like colonialist occupiers. I sometimes say to my friends on the left, if I'm speaking like J Street, I'm like, you guys are colonialists because you're coming with like a Western outlook of land for peace and other things that are totally totally Western and foreign. And so therefore you really are like white colonial Europeans because you, you're not acting like people from this region. Nobody in this region gives up land in general. Nobody. It's not done. In the 55 land conflicts in this region right now, only one party thinks that they could get peace by giving away land. Here's the story. Uh, I was once in Washington, D.C. and I met with a, um, a, a, a Kurdish activist. He was working for a good organization called Emmet. You know Sarah Stern Emmet in DC? Yes. So great organization. Great organization. So this good looking, good guy, Kurdish activist. So I said to him, I go to him. So he's dealing on the Iranian, Kurd Kurdish Iran issue. So I said, because you know, Kurdistan or, or potential Kurdistan has places in Turkey, Iraq, Syria, and Iran. They're, they're all over the place. So I said to him, you know what your problem is? He's, He's like, what? I said, if you want peace, just give away a little bit more of your land to Iran. And we laughed and laughed and laughed. That's all it was. We just were like, ha, ah, ha, ha, what an absurd thought. Obviously, if you give your land away to Iran, you're never going to have peace. And we were just laughing. Other people were like, why are they laughing? Because as, as real Middle Easterners, I said to him the most ridiculous of anti-Middle Eastern you know, uh, discourse. But sadly, uh, uh, Israelis, in part, and certainly American Jews as well, have bought into the two-state narrative, into the idea that we should, you know, cut away our land and that we'll have peace. When, when it's been proven time and time and time again that you give away land, it becomes the forward base of the jihad uh, or weakens us in, in other ways and does not give us peace. It does not give us real peace. It gives us maybe uh, hudna, a kind of time out from war, uh, but it does not give us peace. Maybe, maybe with Jordan, it gave us some kind of quiet time. But, you know, Jordan is anti-Israel, and they learn a lot of anti-Israel stuff. Touring there is very tricky. Uh, and they take a lot of our water and a lot of our farmland, a lot of stuff. So that's, we have problems with Jordan. Egypt also, we've had a kind of cold peace with them for a long time. They teach anti-Semitism there. Sisi is, is different a little bit, but it's still a very anti-Semitic state. Uh, and also... Um, and also not now, not under Sisi, but beforehand was a, was a great funnel for arms into, uh, through the Sinai, uh, to, to Gaza. So, you, you know, I don't believe in, in giving away land. I believe in being a Middle Eastern tribe well, and believing you, you, your <clears throat> own history and believing your own rights. Right. I, I, I like, uh, our friends, Yehuda Hakohen's, uh, sort of like idea to, really, you know, to liberate our own identity, to really to decolonize the Jew and to really understand that we are actually people of Middle East. Something that I have told our students is don't check, when you're checking on, on your college applications, please do not check Caucasian. 
Because I not. never, I never, when I was a kid, I never checked Caucasian. I always wrote other Hebrew Semite. Right. I actually. I'm talking about when I was twelve. I would never. I was like Caucasian. What's that? I'm not from the Caucasus. Right. You know. So that uh, I think is a, is a, it's 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 an important point to sure. uh, that you know our identity has been occupied and we need to liberate liberate our minds and understand that uh, we are people of the Middle East and we should act. Uh, you know. But, but I want to tell you one thing, Masha. Though I, I my good friend Yehuda is is one of my mentors and, and rabbis and friends. Uh, but I but when it comes to being Middle Eastern, I sometimes disagree with him just a little, and I'm only saying this because everybody likes a good disagreement. But we disagree a little bit because he forgets that we are also that Israel was also always interested in the West. We always traded with Europe. We were always Mediterranean basin. And the reason I say this is because I actually think that globalism is one of the most important events in modern Israeli history. Israel is today much more comfortable in its skin because it gets to fly to San Francisco, it gets to fly to Africa or to Europe, and to Israelis get to do their thing, not just for a vacation, but for real work. And they come back home, uh, you know, for Shabbat, and this is home base, but Israelis feel much better about being able to touch the whole world and, and touch it either through Zoom or through airplanes, and it's really changed our e economy. And it's changed also the way people feel about it. Instead of feeling constricted here in Israel, they feel that the world is their oyster from the home base. So that's a, it's, it's a small disagreement that I have with him because he always has, you know, he always wants us to be Middle Eastern, but I always say to him, yeah, we're Middle Eastern, but we're also, we're also at heart globalists. And uh, that's, that's a phenomenon that I think is helping Israel a lot. Listen, um, I think one of, the, one of the myths that we have is this idea of uh, Jewish unity. I mean, it's a great, great idea. I'd love for us to be united, but we are, the most disagreeable people that I probably know. Masha, um, what's our central book? It's the Talmud. The Talmud is page after page after page of disagreement, yeah. which is, uh, which is that's, how, that's how we roll. On the other hand, there's a weakness in that, and that is that we don't have message discipline. If you wake up any Arab in the middle of the night, you just wake him up. You say, what's going on? He says, occupation, apartheid, they've taken my land, uh, you know, they, they have the lines right down. Right. You wake up a Jew in the middle of the night. Well, on the one hand, you know, it is our land and it's biblical and the Six Day War. But on the other hand, there were a lot of people there. And so Jews, we don't have a tight message, you know, that we're like, you know, ready to, 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 to roll out. And we know it and it's simple. We, you know, we're, we are, uh, we keep it very, uh, you know, uh, 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 complex and sophisticated. But at times that hurts us, especially in the PR narrative war, we are not the people of message discipline. Well, and that I mean, weakens us. I can tell you, um, I'm gonna plug my, um, my sticker that I have printed, which is very simple. I think for messaging, anybody who does marketing, it's like, you know, make your messaging simple. And I can tell you as a street warrior, I used to do a lot of street protests. Um, the number one thing on a poster do not have more than three words. So we came up with a sticker. It's called Jews are from Judea. Right. And it has become the controversial sticker from whom? From my fellow Jews who receive Jewish education from elite colleges who are master's degree of Jewish education, who are professor of Jewish studies, who you know, have a real problem with that. Uh, but I'm gonna still move us forward. And uh, there was a question from uh, one of our uh, participants, and that is, um, let's talk about sovereignty, right? Let's talk about, you know, what is happening in politics right now, and where do you see, you know, what happens if we do, if our dreams come true and we, you know, apply sovereignty to the entire land of Israel? How do you see this? And underneath it, from what I remember, I remember I was talking to Mordechai Kedar and he was saying how Sheikh of Hebron uh, is quite sympathetic to the Jewish national sure. idea. So sure. if you could do the, the big picture and then again zoom in on Hebron and the Hebron's um, Arab Muslim community that could be 
sympathetic to our cause? Well, I, I would reframe the question just a little bit. And, uh, and we have to be a, a tad not hindered by political correctness uh, because sometimes it, it halts us from thinking. And I think the real question is, what is the role of non-Jews in the, in the land of Israel and the state of Israel? We have to just really put that out there as just an important, uh, important language. What, what, what are, how are we supposed to relate to non-Jews? And it really then, then they ask the question of what is Israel? Is it a state for Jews, non-Jews, and everybody, or, or what is it? So my simple take is, is that Israel is the ethnic national state for the Jewish people. And that Zionism is the movement for Jewish national self-determination. But that Israel is really created as an ethnic national state to first and foremost protect the rights of this ethnic group called Jews in a harsh Middle East and also give them, that's stage one, stage two, give them the opportunity to have their culture flourish in their ancestral homeland. So defend the Jews, give them a chance to be Jewish in, the, in Judea, as you would say. So that, that's the role. So therefore, what is the role of the non-Jews? Well, if you look back at, San, at, uh, at uh, the Balfour Declaration and at San Remo, it really said it very clearly. We shouldn't prejudice their civil rights or their religious rights. They're supposed to have civil rights. You've got to treat them decently. They've got to have basic civil rights. And they have to have religious rights. They can keep their religion. We could, we could even ask about that because, for example, the Maccabees, uh, the way that they dealt with their uh, uh, few hundred years that they ruled is that they didn't let foreign peoples have different religions in the land. But okay, we're, we're more, let's say, democratic. Let's call it that way. But the first and foremost job of the Jewish people is, of Israel is to defend the Jews and, and make sure that they live in their homeland or sa safely and get to do their culture. Non-Jews in the land, what, are they, what, are, what is their role here? Well, to me, they are resident aliens. They are residents of the state of Israel uh, that get to own their land, get to have rights, upward mobility, have education, have access to roads, technology, hospitals, women's rights, all the stuff that is so lacking in the Middle East. But to, to believe inside that this is our, our land and anybody else that's here is welcome, but he's also a welcome guest. This is a phrase that my friends on the left can never say. They can never say that the Arabs are guests to you. Why exactly? I'm not sure. Jews that lived in Arab lands for uh, 1,400 years always knew that they were guests in the land of the Arabs and that this was tribal lands of the Arabs. And then when Israel became independent, the Arabs said to them, Ruchu el Quds, go to Jerusalem. I've heard this from many old timers who told me that the Arabs in various countries, Iraq, Yemen, etc., told them, Ruchu al Quds, go to Jerusalem, go to your tribal lands. And in our tribal lands, we have to defend our culture from jihadism, from, from physical attacks, and from narrative attacks. So uh, uh, if you ask me uh, what, what is the future, the right future of annexation, we should annex Judea and Samaria because this is our legal, historical, uh, war won and purchased land, uh, the, the heartland of, of the land of Israel. The Gentiles, the Arabs that live there should immediately get, get residency. Even residency is a privilege with uh, 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 obligations. And those obligations are to pay the taxes, follow the laws, serve the state like everybody else, and receive its benefits. It's not just benefits, it's, it's, it's obligations. That's the way I would do the whole thing. Now, uh, some people don't like that. They say to me, you know, how could you have, you know, they go into second class citizen and they go into, uh, into um, uh, questions of apartheid. I say to them, look, you, 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 you have an overinflated sense of, of democracy. Even in great democracies like the United States, there are different situations, different levels. For example, and people tell me it's not a good example, but I think it is a good example. An example is Puerto Rico. You have a territory which is administered by the United States. There's 2 million people living there. They have uh, civil rights, certainly, but they do not have voting rights for president of the United States. Can they vote for um, uh, congressmen and senators? Yes. 
but those congressmen and senators are not non-voting congressmen and senators. So they have representation, but, but it's not the same. And the Puerto Ricans are not dangerous to the United States in any way. But the Arabs who have been trained for many hundreds of years in, in anti-Semitism, and certainly the Palestinian Arabs who have been taught from the, and I, I say this as my Arab friends tell me this all the time, we are taught from our mother's milk to hate Israel, uh, and certainly in the curriculum, uh, I would not give them citizenship. I mean, voting citizenship. I would give them residency. And I think that we have to divide between liberty and democracy. We have to ensure that people have liberty, good people that are law-abiding, non-jihadist, loyal people uh, should have liberty, but not necessarily full voting rights. That's the way I would do it. But there are other solutions. The solution that I just gave now is, is the more, let's say it's, more, it's the most robust one. But there's other ones. For example, a very, very important solution, very important solution is that Jordan is Palestine. Give, and the Jordanians are the ones that moved Arabs into the West Bank. 1988 came and the uh, king of Jordan just removed everybody, took away everybody's citizenship in the West Bank. We say reinstate them. Give them their Jordanian citizenship back. Let them live in Israel as residents with a lot of rights but let them vote democratically in the Arab state, the Palestinian Arab state right next door, which is called Jordan. So stay in Israel, uh, but vote in Jordan. But of course, if you stay in Israel, you have to be non-jihadist. And here it comes to a problem of compliance. You know, the state of Israel sadly does not understand that our beloved state of Israel, I never say the state of Israel, so I, our beloved state of Israel does not understand that you cannot hope for loyalty. You have to demand loyalty. It's not going to come because they like you. It's going to come because they understand that you mean business, that you're strong. So, for example, the Arab in Hebron, the Arab clan of 40,000 people called the Jabri clan, they understand that. And they, when I'm, whenever I'm in meetings with them, they're always telling us, but you have to be strong with us. Now, the Israelis don't even understand what that means. They mean make sure to force compliance or else there's going to be people who are going to teach jihadism. You've got to be tough against it on social media and in the mosques and in the schools. I'll give you another crazy example. In Eastern Jerusalem that is administered by Israel, the schools teach a Palestinian curriculum school book, which is full of hate against Israel. You think you have it bad in California, Masha? In, in, in the Palestinian school books, it's much worse. And so hey, Israel, if you're going to have Arabs living amongst us, you have to force them to study decent stuff or else they're going to grow up to hate Israel because that's what these are teaching. You have to force compliance. Sadly, we're living in a time where the word forcing compliance is itself somehow outside of the scope of people's ability to, to compute. Uh, but it's not outside of my ability to compute. And I think it also partially because of, of Russian Jewishness. Um, and I think that there are good solutions, but in all solutions, Israel has to be, we have a Hebrew word, takif, um, aggressive, aggressive in our stance against jihadism. Now, the, the funny thing is, is that when you're strong against the bad guys, you can let the good guys have a voice again. What I mean is the decent Arabs, there are many of them that hate the PA, hate the jihad, want to live a decent life, can't speak because they're under the thumb of jihadism. So I'll give you a little story. This is an important story. One time I, I was living in East Jerusalem just, for many years. Just so you years. know, there was a lot of questions coming up. So. Okay. All right. So I'll, 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 wait to, I'll make the story later. Remind me to tell you the story about, about the East Jerusalem Arab Daoud in his store. Okay. All right. Okay, so I'm going to open up the mic for uh, Zelig. Zelig, you uh, posted an important question. And as a piggyback, Alex, um, you also uh, chimed in with, uh, you know, this whole idea that, you know, calling people. So, Zelig, go ahead. Actually, explain your question. Yeah, sure. So I've worked a lot with the Druze in the Golan and in the Galil. And they're different types of Druze. As we know, the ones in the Galil, they also were in the army. The ones in the Golan, not yet. Um, but uh, they're extremely sensitive to land, to, to being connected to their land, to owning the land. And the ones in the Galil are also very, they were very sensitive to the citizenship law, which I was actually kind of surprised. 
because they're so loyal to Israel and they really have misirut nefesh. Like a lot of the young people, they risk their lives to defend Israel. They all go to the IDF. Right. They're incredible human beings. They're like what we want to add our, our, our quote-unquote guests to be like. Correct. But I think that they would resent very much to be called guests. They see themselves mamash as full citizens with voting rights and everything. Okay, and because is that like the answer to that is very simple. They, they are truly loyal. And right. they, they really, so, so that's a completely different thing. The heart, by the way, the difference between an Arab and a Druze hardware wise of a human being is, is almost non-existent. They're ethnically almost the same, but the software is a completely different software that they run. One right. runs the software of loyalty. The other one runs the software of, of jihad. And so, and so, yeah, you know, they're resentful. I want to tell you something. The, the nationality law is a great law, but they should have been more sensitive to talk about um, they could have put in a line saying, and we honor our, our friends and our partners and our, in our, in our, you know, in our, you know, the, 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 the families of the Druze who are, who are part of Israel's, uh, mosaic. They could have said that and it would have been, they would have been happy. Uh, moreover, by the way, I actually think that Arabic should be a national language in Israel because I think that we all have to learn Arabic and we have to know Arabic and understand Arabic as part of this region. This region will always speak Arabic or in the foreseeable 500 years. So we have to, we have to know Arabic and we have to know what they're saying. We have to know how to, how to talk with them. Um, th the Druze are, are, are an excellent example. They might, not, they might not like the word guests, but, but they are guests. And, but they are the, exactly the kind of guests who are, who are welcome in this land. Again, by the way, I believe that people should have right to their land. They should have a right to their land. They own that property. It's their property. And they ha should have every access to decency. And they do, by the way. If you've ever been to a Druze community, as you have, how do they look? Fabulous. Amazing. You know, I, I, yeah. I wish I had a house like the Druze okay. folks. And I've, I've, I, I, know I have many Druze colleagues and friends. Uh, and, uh, and they're exactly that type. But at, at the end, they are non-jihadist. And the reason they're non-jihadist is because their ideology and their religion uh, is different. By the way, there are some anti-Israel Druze in the Golan, for example, that are like Syrian stuff. Okay, that's not good. That, that's got to be, you don't get the rights of the state of Israel if you don't fulfill its obligations, if you teach anti-Israel uh, ideology. And you, and, and you have to demand it. You have to demand it. And by the way, notice that they serve in the army, serve with distinction. The, the commander of the Gol Golani Brigade recently was a Druze. So, so, you know, they're, they're a great example. And by the way, they're also proof that we're not racist. We don't have a racist sense against, the, against Arab peoples. Quite the opposite. Uh, we, the truth of the matter is Israelis are anything but racist. They really do like, they're not only not racist, but they're not xenophobic. They just like other peoples. We enjoy having a colorful country uh, with, uh, with, with different kinds of people. Um, but, but the Arabs have a long way to get there until they get to, to Druze status. Okay? The Druze have proven themselves, so we're not afraid of them. The Druze voting bloc is, is, is you know, they vote Likud. They, they, they have a nationalist outlook. By the way, Let's remember also that the Druze don't get along with the Arabs very well. Right. And I so just you want have... to mention just uh, one thing. When I, I met with uh, uh, the mayors of Bukata and Majd al-Shams, which were two of the biggest Druze villages in, in the Golan Heights. Sure. And by the, by the way, like, there are 27,000 Druze in the Golan and about 23,000 Jews, and more Druze than Jews. Extremely friendly. But when I, when I, um, in one of my conversations with uh, Dolan, who's the mayor of Majd al-Shams, the biggest Druze village, and I mentioned to him, I don't know how this came in our conversation, but that the Golan is actually part of the tribe of Menashe. And he got a little nervous. <laughs> but he's like, what do you mean? This is our land. <laughs> like, so I, I think that, uh, you know, and obviously we kind of, uh, we, uh, you know, got out of it somehow. Uh, but I think that there's, there should be a way to, it, it, to it package been, it. It would, it would have been healthier. Again. Yeah. You know, you know what it is, Zelig. You're, you're. I hear what you're saying, and 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 I respect it. I'm coming. I'm coming at it from a different place. I, I actually think that there should be something clear, and not so nice. <laughs> there should be a tad of less niceness. And this whole idea of Jews as being always nice is not so healthy. It's better to be a tad less nice and make it clear, 
so that you don't have a problem down the line. I like that. If yeah. you're not clear with what you claim is yours and you're constantly feeling that you have to be nice, people will, will, will take more from you at the end than you want. Okay. And it's better to have clarity. I, I actually think that Israel lacks a lot of clarity in a lot of different issues. We don't speak with clarity today. And I hope we can resolve that. There's many fields that we're not clear with. For example, anybody tries to uh, 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 convert to Judaism, it's one of the least clear path, pathways, least clear pathways ever. Speak to anybody who's done it. Uh, who has to go to the army? Well, this Arab, yes. This Arab, no. This ultra-Orthodox, no. This Tel Aviv guy, no. But this guy, yes. We, we have a lot of stuff that we need to make a little... Uh, does the Supreme Court have a right to decide anything they want? Well, kind of yes, kind of no. There's a lot of lack of clarity. And I think that one of the main goals of the next kind of stage of Israel is to clarify things. I, I said to you before, people should have their land rights. We should make a distinction between land rights and national rights. You have rights to your house, but not to a state. I'll give you a bad example. You guys in San Francisco and New York and Toronto, maybe, you guys have a Chinatown, right? Chinatown, the people there are Chinese people. The newspapers, Chinese. Medicine, Chinese. Food, Chinese. The signs are in Chinese. It's called Chinatown. But if any person there said, this is now part of China, that would be called sedition. They get it. It's everything culturally there. Nobody's taking away your culture. We love it. But this is the United States in terms of the sovereign. And so too with your friends in the Golan. Sure. You get your right to your house, but please make it understood. You, you live within the Jewish state. You know, the word guest is maybe not the right word. Just understand yeah. that you have to swear allegiance to the Jewish state of Israel. Okay? 100%. And that, that will make it clear. Okay. Yeah. I, don't know, I don't know how, but I, I thought I had an original thought when I was trying to teach kids that, you know, the Chinatown, the Chinese exam. That's really funny. Okay. I'm going to move on to a Martin. Martin, you had a question. Um, this sort of like brings us back to uh, Hebron. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question, please? Uh, yeah. Uh, so, Yishai, the number of Jews living in Hebron right now is extremely small. Uh, is that because the Israeli government intentionally makes it hard for Jews to move there and places strict limits? And if the Israeli government were to change its policy and say, if you want to move to Hebron, we're not going to stand in your way. Go right ahead. Do you think there'd be a huge influx of Jews into the city? And how would that affect the character of the city and the position of Jews in the city? Yeah, we face a tremendous bureaucracy. Uh, we have a hard time uh, building new, new apartments in places like Kirat Arba, although we are building new apartments in Kirat Arba. In Hebron, we have a very hard time purchasing houses or we have a hard time with the Israeli government recouping houses that we owned Previous to 1929, the massacre that destroyed the Jewish community there. We have a lot of property that we still own, we have not recouped. Uh, and we have also a hard time with the Israeli government when we purchase a plot of land to let, have the defense ministry um, recognize our purchase rights. So we, have, we, we just face tremendous hurdles. Moreover, if the state, and, and there, there were people in the state of Israel a long time ago who said, listen, we have to build up Kiryat Arba so big so that it'll encompass Arab Hebron. And that was the plan of Yigal alone. It didn't happen. And exactly the opposite happened, which is the Arab Hebron now encompasses Jewish Kiryat Arba from, from three sides. Uh, you know, just the other day, I had a simple realization. We need a train. We need a train. We need a train from Hebron to either Beersheba or even more close to Kiryat Gat. Kiryat Gat is kind of down the mountain uh, to the west. And if we had a train to Kiryat Gat, we could develop Hebron because it's a little bit of an outlier place. It's about an hour from everything. Uh, but if you can give people a train, it makes a big difference. Re recently, a train was opened in the Jezreel Valley. It's called Rekevet HaEmek, the, uh, the train of the valley. And it goes from Beit She'an all the way to Haifa. It goes east-west. And that's changed the economics of the whole region, which is a place that people have a hard time moving to. But now if they could get a job in the so-called center by getting on the train, and they could park and ride, or maybe in the West Coast it's called kiss and ride, uh, 
then great. You know what I mean? You could develop a place. Same, same thing with, with Hebron and the whole Judea and Samaria region. We need trains. We need the ability to get there. The road, the ancient, ancient road between Hebron and Jerusalem, which is more than a 3,000-year-old road, uh, it was, was an official Roman road, is one lane going each way to this very day. So you cannot develop uh, uh, an area seriously if you have these weak infrastructure, no train. Yeah, we do our best with the buses that come every hour. But if the state of Israel wanted to develop this, this region, we could do a lot, a lot to, to take it to the next step. Well, what about the attitude of the Israeli government? Because if the Israeli government prevents Jews actively from moving to Hebron, does that mean that, well, we're not sure we have a right to this land? And how can we expect the world to believe that this is our land if we're not even sure of it ourselves? Well, absolutely. That's, that's absolutely correct. Uh, the state of Israel, it doesn't have one voice. The so-called settlers are folks that, and their supporters, which are today a huge amount of people in Israel, uh, believe that we do have that right. But there are people that are either in the center who are not sure or on the left who are sure that we shouldn't be there. And so therefore we're in a club Z situation. We have to educate and we have to agitate and we have to work uh, within our government um, uh, to, to move the ball forward. We've, we have through th thick and thin have managed to settle uh, th this land and build up big communities like Malad, Dumim, Ariel, Gush Etzion. And, and the small ones, um, the, the medium-sized ones like Beit El and, uh, and Ofra and, and Kiryat Arba and the small ones, we've really managed to, to, to raise a generation of, of courageous Jews who love this land, who are connected to it, and have also been active politically. Uh, but we're not there yet. Um, we're still fighting every single day. Uh, and we're fighting also fear because the other side is good at generating fear. That's, by the way, one of the narratives of the other side. One of their narratives is they're scary. They're dangerous. Terrorism is really a narrative tool. It's a creation of a story, which is it's dangerous and scary to take a bus down to Hebron. And so many people don't end up showing up. We have to fight that narrative. One of the ways we have to fight that narrative is through what I said, which I think maybe the spirit of what I was talking about is being strong. But there's a completely different way that we're operating, which is tourism, ancient site, ancient city, first capital of Israel, a tomb of the fathers and mothers, city of love, that whole thing. Come see it for yourself. Come connect. Uh, that's another way that we're operating to bring people more connected, more closely. Recently, I went to Kirat Arbor to check out some apartments. They built a huge apartment complex. I went to, to see if there was any... Uh, uh, apartments to, to, to rent or purchase, they were all sold out. The truth is we have a lot of success. We have schools that teach this. Like, like what Masha is working with in the schools, we actually have my kids go to a school where they teach Jewish rights in the land of Israel, especially in Judea and Samaria. We have political parties dedicated to this. Within other political parties, we have members that do this. So we have, we have thank God, we have done a lot to move it forward and, and, and we still have a lot to go. All right, um, so we're going to move towards wrapping things up. Um, I know that Alex wanted to ask a question, and if you have any more questions, speak now in the chat or forever hold your peace, uh, because then we're going to be moving towards uh, wrapping things up. Alex. Hello, everyone. Uh, Isha, thank you so much for your lecture. Very interesting. My question is the following. Uh, There's a couple of hundred thousands of uh, Russian uh, Jews who are oftentimes not considered to be Jews and maybe are not halakhically Jewish. What would you think, what do you think about them? I mean, about the fact that a lot of them actually want to be Jewish or maybe may not find themselves uh, in the current situation. Uh, a lot of them die for the country. They all serve in the army. Yeah. So, so the f f first thing is, is that amongst the, um, more than over a million Russian Jews that have arrived in Israel, there's some percentage, maybe 200,000 of them are not halakhically Jewish. So 
so you know the the Israel is a state that a Jewish state that homogenizes you. You end up marrying Jewish. You end up, you know, living a, a more Jewish life. There's the army will help you convert if you're interested in it. Um, some people are economic migrants who've basically been able to take the opportunity to get out of Ukraine, for example. And I, I visited Ukraine a few times in the last few years, and I can understand why somebody would want to leave that place. With respect, I say that. Israel is just happens to be a better socioeconomic country than, than Ukraine uh, and, and other problems that Ukraine faces. Uh, for example, medicine. Uh, so you can understand why people want to come to Israel. Uh, we have, have laws that are a little bit too liberal, letting people who are really not even like, 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 you know, th it's not just, it's not just uh, if you're, if you're, if your mother is not Jewish and your father is Jewish, if that would be the case, I think that would be great. But you have a situation in which people who's, who have one grandparent that's Jewish and, and, and they come in, they're really not connected. But I think that Israel has to create a core curriculum. You have to know Israeli civics, Jewish civics. You have to understand the root of the, my wife is from Texas. In Texas, you knew the Alamo. You knew Texas history. You were schooled in Texas history and you understood it. Um, a lot of these Russian Jews, and I've been with them in the army as well, are, are not plugged in to the story of Israel and really see it as a place to live that doesn't have a strong identity. They don't understand it. And they're really part of a, of a culture in Israel that, that doesn't plug them in. And we've got to do a much better job pl plugging people in. If you're going to come and live here, you've got to know and feel the story, even if you're not one of us exactly. Okay. Uh, but this is not Canada. Canada is a great place to go to and be who you want to be and just live a nice life. Uh, or, or, you know, Israel is not, it's not like that. It's an ethnic national state and you basically have to a little bit fit in. We've got to do a much better job making them fit into the story. Uh, but I would also limit the laws a little bit, not to let uh, as many kind of people who are really not, you know, not closely Jewish. Now, halakhically speaking, there is, there is, people that say that if your father is Jewish, but your mother is not Jewish, then you are not, not you, you are not Jewish, but you are partially Jewish, even by halacha. And we say, work to bring that person in. Okay, work to bring that person a little bit closer. It's called, it's called Zera Israel. It's a different halachic status. Um, but, but all that is, to, to me, you know, uh, a secondary to, to teaching a strong culture of Israel. Uh, and I'll give you an example, which is Hanukkah. 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 Everybody loves Hanukkah, right? You love Hanukkah? I love Hanukkah. It's one of my favorite holidays. But Hanukkah is a deep story of 25 years of a Jewish battle against foreign intervention and amazing heroism and an amazing story of, of gen brothers and generations. But if you don't know the story of Hanukkah, and it's just about lighting some candles, and then instead you feel like maybe I could light some, uh, like have a, a Christmas tree here, or a, you know, Nove God tree, uh, I, to, to me, that really is not, it's not what, what, the, what the story of Israel is really about. So the way to do it is not through law. It's not through forcing people. But it is through a strong culture. You, have, you can't have a, a, a vacuum of culture. You've got to educate a strong identity. You educate a strong identity, then people are with you. If you don't educate that, then other cultures sneak in. And so some of these Russian non-Jews sneak in other cultures, and then it becomes more of a problem uh, than, um, than, um, than an advantage. Let's just make, make it clear. Russian Jews have had a tremendous boon to this country in terms of so many things, technology, sports, Sports, sciences, uh, 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 and, and you know, Russian Jews are very, very passionate wherever they are. My mom is a Russian Jew, and she's got a whole crew of friends that all go to the Temple Mount and fight for it. It's you know, it, it, so so there's a lot of very, very wonderful and strong Russian Jews in our country, um, uh, but there are some who who that are not Jewish that we we should we should work a little bit harder to make them part of the story. Alex, are you? Is this, was it the answer you were looking for? I think, yeah. 
Okay. Absolutely. All right. Awesome. Thank okay. You. So, um, Lachaim. Lachaim. Imagine, uh, Ishai, you had a magic wand and you could get all of the top unapologetic Zionists into the room and you had a week to work on problems of the Jewish people. What would be your top three things that you would want to solve? What, what would be sort of like prioritize for us? Um, it goes right back to Alex's question, which is, which is I would work a lot today on culture. I work today a lot on culture. First thing, I would overhaul the education. Plain education. Like I want people to know. First thing, I want them to know basic Judaism, basic Jewish ideas and laws, things like the months, for example. I want people to know the months. I want them to know basic storyline of the Jewish people, basic history of the Jewish people. I think that's absolutely key. Uh, I would, for example, have them know the story of Masada and know the story of the Bar Kokhba revolt and certainly the story of, uh, of, the, of the Maccabees. I would have them really understand that we have a very long history in this land and I would disabuse them of the idea that Israel was born in 1947 by the United Nations. Okay, I would really work on that first. First is teach the history, uh, uh, and I don't mean religious, like, like indoctrinate religion, but teach them the basics so they understand how long our peoplehood has been, um, its great history in these places, the battles that we fought 2,000 years ago to push out the Greeks from Jaffa or from Jerusalem. If you understand that, then you have a completely different sense of what we're doing today. You just don't, you don't think that we're just like showed up here and as colonizers, but you understand that we have a deep, deep history in this land. By the way, you could just, you could just go to Wikipedia and like uh, recently I read the Wikipedia entrance on Ashkelon. I highly recommend it. Just Ashkelon. This is a 4,500 year old city that the Egyptians before there was a Jewish people were, were like writing about. This is an ancient, ancient, ancient place. And we've been there for, for a very long time. We have many, many you know, connections to this town, Ashkelon. I love Ashkelon and Jaffa and Akko. So, so when, you, you, when, you, when you have a sense of connection, that's, I think that's, that's the first one. Uh, then I would make also Jerusalem more central to people. I would love to make Jerusalem more central. I'll give you, I'll give you examples. I, I, I like to think this way. Imagine that you drove into Jerusalem and instead of there having like a welcome sign that's made out of bushes, it had a golden arch. Every entrance to Jerusalem had a golden gate made of gold or a gold plating. And you'd be like, wow, Jerusalem, city of gold, city of eternity. Uh, you have to be wowed by our stuff. I am always amazed at how unwowed we are at our stuff. We live in a time of wow, 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 okay? We live in a time where, where we're, we're seeing things that could only have been a dream to, to see a people reborn in its land with its language, fighting successful wars, raising up its economy. It, it's just unheard of that, that a nation could be exiled from its land and come back with this. So I would, I would definitely uh, uh, try to work on the wow factor of Jerusalem uh, and, and, and education, education as well. Education, wow factor, and the third? The third one is I would make sure to connect our diaspora Jews to the land of Israel a little bit better. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, the, the ancient way is that you come to Israel and to Jerusalem three times a year. So people like yourselves want to come to Israel on, let's say, the three times a year include Pesach, Sukkot, and Shavuot. So people want to come in Pesach and, and Sukkot. What's the problem? it costs three times, four times as much, right? I say the government should work on lowering prices for those chagim. Drop airport taxes, drop fuel taxes. Find ways to make it that, that everybody that's on this call right now can come cheaply for Pesach or for, for Sukkot. And we Jews, we do this wherever we go. We're always outpricing ourselves. We outprice ourselves in education. We outprice ourselves in real estate. Wherever we move in, we make it impossible to live. It's a bad way. And it's the same thing with, with Israel. I say we have to work much harder in order to, to make it cheaper and easier. For example, uh, are you a college student in America? You're going on spring break? Spring break in Israel. Come to spring break in Israel. Instead of Acapulco, come to Israel. Okay, get some 
experience, do a little archaeology, have some fun, you know, meet a nice Jewish girl or boy, you know, like, like we've got to draw in the, the diaspora uh, through making it, making the gateway to entry a little bit easier, uh, a, a little bit easier. And it's, and it's become much easier, but still, uh, we, we can't outprice ourselves. We have to make it, we have to make it uh, 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 um, more, more affordable, more normal. Um, I would add one more thing. That, 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 that another way that diaspora Jews can really connect to Israel is through Israeli products, uh, drinking Israeli wine. I always tell people, Friday night, just drink wine from the land of Israel. That's my standard recommendation for everybody, wine from the land of Israel. Not so that you could support Israel, but so that Israel could be inside your veins. Okay. Right. And Masha, you ever have a, a, a weekend? Make sure to buy that Israeli wine. Okay. It'll make all the difference. I promise you. Buy Israeli water, buy Israeli soft drinks, okay? It'll, it, 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 it will do a magic without you even noticing. People will become more, because you are what you eat, and people will become more connected. So I would take steps to make sure that the diaspora would become more connected. You know, I went to Yeshiva University. They barely had any programs in Israel. Yeshiva University. They have, I went to their law school. Did they have the legal center for the defense of Israel? No. Nothing. Nothing. Okay, uh, we, we were the Club Z of then, we were called Kuma. You know, we, we were pushing uh, that agenda, but uh, I, would, I would make sure to create a bridge, uh, a bridge between the, U United, the, the diaspora Jewry, especially North American Jewry uh, in Israel. I would make a bridge, and, and your line is uh, Jews are from Judea. Uh, my line is build Israel together, build Israel together, because this is a Jewish peoplehood mission of a lifetime of, of, of these generations to build up the state of Israel, wherever we are, whoever we are, we're part of a, an amazing story. So that, those, those would be the things that I would work on. Beautiful. I, I will add the, the fourth festival to bring uh, American Jews or any kind of Jews to Israel. And that is the two weeks, you know, between Yom HaShoah and Yom HaTzma'ut. I think it's the most imagine, amazing time to be in Israel and the weather is perfect. And right. And you can eat the bread, so that's you know. You're, you're right, and and by the way, you you said Yom Hashoah and Yom Atz, Yom Yisrael and Yom Atzmut. We also have Yom Yerushalayim. And Yom Yerushalayim. It's one Yerushalayim, of the most right. incredible days. So the, the two it's, weeks. Yeah, yeah. It's just it's just one of the greatest days of them all. It all comes together on, on Yom Yerushalayim. So I w I would help us get back to passion. I say in Hebrew it works better. Zionism, not cynicism, but in Hebrew it's better. It's Tzionut Lotziniut. Okay, so it sounds very similar. Tzionut lotziniut, Zionism, not cynicism. So I, I, I think that we have to fight cynicism, which is a, a darkness that wants to make us not excited about our time. We've got to be, we've got to be heated up. And right. I think that uh, you guys are uh, the people on this call, and certainly Club Z is doing a fabulous, fabulous job of keeping the heat. Masha, it's not just defense. We've got to get them psyched about, about the story of Israel. All right, so we're going to give the last question of the evening to uh, Naya. Hello, Yishai. My name is Naya. I'm the we have met. Oh, you remember me. Yay. I remember you too at Limud. So when I met you, I was now I'm officially full-time director of education for Club C. Um, I work wow. with Club Z. Wow, congratulations. I'm, I didn't know that. Congratulations. I'm a lover of Club Z. I'm a, I'm a Club Zer for life. Um, so my question to you is basically, I, I want to bring it back to Club C. As director of education, as a Russian Jew, one of the things that I push for in this curriculum that I'm developing is peoplehood. This is what American Jews are lacking. Indeed, I just came across that American Jewry, the reform movement in 1919, took an oath. It was called the Pittsburgh Platform that right. said, I don't know, you right? that we I've are no longer it. going to be seen as a nation, but as a religion. I, right. I would like to ask your advice. By the way, I, that's I a Napoleonic, did. that's Napoleon's idea as well. Exactly Absolutely. his idea. Right. You're French, I, but you, your religion is, is Jewish. Uh, as a Russian Jew, like you started off, as Masha is a Russian Jew, and Club Z, we are positioned in that unique space in that a lot of our students are Russian Jews, but we are touching the hearts and minds of all of our Jewish family but it's very hard to convince American Jews that we are a people. And I need, I would like some of your advice on that. 
giving up for Club Z? You know, uh, it's, Naya, first and congratulations on your position and lots of success. Uh, I actually remember one of my most memorable talks uh, is that I spoke to, I don't remember where it was, was it in Oakland maybe? But I spoke to, a, uh, Masha had me speaking to a lot of young teens. Where was this, Masha? It, it, it was Limud FSU, yeah, it was there. In Oakland, okay. Yeah. So, so here I am in a room with a lot of young people who really don't know much about Judaism, but they're good kids, really good kids. And, and I had to talk to them about Hebron, and I'm like, how am I going to talk to them about Hebron? And I remember deliberating inside myself, how am I going to talk to them? And it was interesting. I came up with something with, which I think worked. And I said to them like this, I said, do you believe that we're a religion or a people? And since they were Russian Jews, they mostly all said people. I said, great. So do we have any, uh, if we're a people, that means that we probably started as a, as a family of some kind. We're a, tri we're a tribe, right? They're like, yes, we're a tribe. We're a people. I'm like, do we have any founding members? So they thought about it and they were like, well, I think I've heard of this founding members. And some of them knew some of the names. They didn't know all the names. And they started, you know, piecing together this idea that we have joint ancestry, forefathers and mothers, that we come from somewhere. And I told them, you know, that those people uh, are, uh, are buried in Hebron. And that started the whole conversation. So it was like, I went backwards from what I found that they already knew or felt and, and went in order to, to fill out their, uh, the, the information that they already had and, and fill it out with, you know, historical information. Look, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, uh, uh, I'm not a, I actually have taught, I taught third grade for many years at uh, Temple Emmanuel in New York City. That's true now that I remember that. But um, um, one thing that I would do that I, that made a big difference on me is I would develop a timeline of Jewish history. I would develop a nice timeline. If you, if you have a timeline so that people have a sense of how long and how powerful Jewish history has been and the commonwealths and the kings and show them the archaeology and the history and from time to time show them that it's written in the Bible as well, in the Torah, in the Tanakh. If kids get a sense of the longness of our peoplehood and the actions that we've taken and they get a better sense of that, they'll have a better sense of pride of our achievements uh, in the past and what we should be doing in the future. I find that when you don't have a sense of history, most of us, most of us, if I ask people in, in, even in this Zoom right now, did the Babylonians destroy the first or the second temple? I tell you something, I think some people in this call won't know. I, was, who came first, the, the, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Romans, or the, or the Greeks? The Greeks or the Romans, which ones came first? A lot of people won't know. When you start to know this stuff, you start to become much more powerful. You start first thing to be proud of the kind of long Jewish history and you have a different sense. Uh, I would take cities and talk about the, the history of the whole arc of the city, like Jerusalem. I would teach Jerusalem as the story of Jerusalem as a city. And I think that people will take a lot of pride. Jews live this way as weak, but sometimes they were strong. And, and here we are, they'll have a whole arc of the sense. I think that that's the first thing to do. I, uh, that's, that's what I would do. I would teach them the history and test them until they know it. Remind them that there was a, a commonwealth and it was, it, was, it was started by King David and Solomon and his sons, it was destroyed by the Babylonians, Chaldeans. And then we went into Persian exile and then the Persians, uh, uh, Babylonian exile. Then we went into the, the Persians let us build back and then it was stopped. And then there was the Esther story. And then we, uh, you know, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah came and they, and they built up, uh, the, 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 the second temple and it became Greek. And then Alexander the Great, the, well, first Alexander came and, and he had a relationship with the, the high priest and, and, then, uh, and, then, and then the bad Greeks after Alexander. And then, and then the Maccabees rose up and made a war and they became Romans at the end. And a Roman Jewish king named Herod built the second temple and then it was destroyed. And then we wrote the Mishnah and the Talmud and then the Arabs came, and then the, the Crusaders came, but Jews came with the, some of the Crusaders uh, to the port of Akko. And, and the Rambam came in 1166 to the land of Israel. And then finally, 1492, Jews are kicked out of Spain, and then they come to Turkey, 
And in 1517, the Turks conquered the land of Israel and Jews moved down from Istanbul to the land of Israel. You see what I'm getting at? It's like when, when, I, get it, when I hear all this, I get so excited. Maybe it's because of my mother. My mother is a, is a historian type person. She's a chemist. Of course, she's a Russian Jew, but she's also a, a great historian. So to me, when I see the arc of Jewish history, I get excited. I get excited about all that we've been through. And I'll, I'll finish off by this. Our, the word in Hebrew, netz, victory, the word for victory is netzach. Netzach. Netzach means victory, but it also means eternity. Our great victory is our, we've seen all these great empires. We carry some of their memory and we've outlived them. That to me is, uh, is, an, is, is, is an incredible thing. By the way, the word netzach also means one more thing, which is composition, song, singing, right? So our victory is our eternity and it's also a beautiful song. Uh, it's, all, it's all encapsulated in one word. I think that's, that's what I would do. Uh, and of course, bring them on trips and, and serve them free alcohol. Those are the, those are the keys to, uh, the alcohol is key. All right, Naya. That's my secret weapon. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ishai. This was a great uh, third installation of our um, Big Ideas After Dark. And I can't wait to see you in Israel uh, as soon as uh, Israel would allow us to uh, come and, um, and uh, be one with the land. Amen. And we miss you very much. And, and we've all learned through Corona that A, we could be disconnected from the land and that's painful. But we've also learned through Zoom that we can be connected in other ways. Uh, and I just want to finish off uh, with, uh, I, I, am, I myself have many mentors who are your friends as well. Uh, if it's Yehuda Cohen or if it's Mordechai Kedar. But another great guy, I hope he comes and speaks for you, is Richard Kemp. Oh, Richard. Richard he's one of the greatest guys. Richard and he would speak for you. He, 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 would, yeah. he has. He has spoken for us. He's the best. He's, so also, Richard, he's also renamed Richard, us. <laughs> so, you know, you said, you said, uh, you said you, no more than three words. He's got two words. His two words are keep attacking. That's his words. Keep attacking. I like that very much. So let's keep attacking. Let's build Israel together. And I really commend you. And it's an honor to be with you. And I wish you guys, uh, we say after Shavuot, we say, uh, have a good summer. Have a good zimmer. We have a, have a good summer. I wish everybody a good summer, and I hope that you guys uh, get on the next plane in August or whenever we we open up here. As soon as you guys are open, we're there.